So I am really enjoying that I am here on this conference, especially that I am currently in between the audience and the beer. So I will try to be uh, short in presentation, fast enough, so I don't get hammered by necessity of beer. Uh, today's talks will be about Internet of Things, a very popular topic. You cannot get rid of it. It's all over the media. It's huge hype over there. But the topic for today will be also about protocols and especially why should you care about it in the first place. So, it's, my name is Dejan Pimic and I work in a company called Smith Micro. There I am a vice president of engineering, which is kind of normal for old, not so hairy guy, slightly chubby. Uh, you have some of my content on uh, social medias. I'm passionate programmer, nevertheless. I also contributor to open source projects. I'm co-founder of some developers groups back in Belgrade, like Ruby Serbia and JS Belgrade. We have a couple of meetings, very popular. But it's not about me, it's about Internet of Things. And where we are today, let's say that uh, this revolution is already started. It's in an early stage. Not so long ago, there were connected devices in a number of this particular city, which is kind of interesting for people from America to compare with their cities, but they are also doing these surveys, so we have to live with it. Uh, but today we are surpassing that number, and the number of currently de connected devices is around 25 billion, which is kind of three times the population of humans on this planet, a total population of humans on this planet. The picture here is one day of internet activity. There is a group of people that want to ping every server that is available online and they do that to produce this type of picture. So we see how the activity on internet is currently available and they do it for a long period of time so they can see the shift in uh, connectivity on the planet. Very interesting stuff. But it's not only about the current state. It's easy to, to know the past, and it's easy to describe the current presence. It's about uh, predictions, and we all need predictions. We all need to know what we want to invest and what to expect from that investment. And in order to choose one or the other, from the investment pool, we need to have some predictions. And there are companies that do that for a living. And I take that one from uh, Procter & Gamble. And what they say is that there will be around 50 billion connected devices in a 10 years time. So that number will be very high and that uh, essentially for the notion of in, in, in this domain of Internet of Things, everything that can be connected will be connected. And by means everything, I mean literally everything. So even these chairs in this nice uh, room will be connected to the Internet so we can sense if the chair is occupied or not, is the fabric still nice and cozy or it's not, if it, the chair is need of maintenance or not. This type of information we will get from the chair itself. And this information is needed so we don't spend too much time on unneeded maintenance. It's also about the money and we need these predictions for to sustain our existence. So the predictions are that in this 10 years time, the value 
that will be in the internet of things and I mean you know everything that we were doing that, that you will doing is around four to eleven trillion dollars and it's spread in different industries so factories and transportation and smart cities as they are big we'll get the most of it health as well but in a sense in any niche of human activity the internet of things will have its solutions and will earn some living there and you will be involved in a project to build that solutions for internet of things com components uh, there is like a list of them that are defining what the Internet of Things are based off and the things is the like a light motive like a sensors or anything that can produce some data there is also term like a web of things but the things is the light motive there as well so we have uh, sensors, we have actuators, which means something that can produce some work or can do some stuff. We have some virtual objects, and virtual object is your email box. There is no box there. It's just uh, virtual stuff. Electronic money is also not a real one, but you can buy, like using PayPal. They have a, a, your wallet, which is not real. My, mine is for leather. There is from some electrons over there. We usually forget that the essential and very key part of Internet of Things are people. So we are also part of the things that will be influenced, that will get, get generate data, and that will consume data, and that the living will be depend on the Internet of Things, we have services, platforms, and eventually everything has to be connected. So various types of networks will be also part, is essential part of Internet of Things, and it will be part of our everyday life and work. But in order to reach the goal of having this successful project and earn this 11 point something trillion dollars, there are some pre-requirements and you have already started to work on them and we as a society have started to work on them. One of the maybe most important are cheap hardware and also not so cheap because we earn on that as a developer's software. There are some regulations that are need to be in place in order that we can have interoperability, which is a key element. But also there is a regulation that needs to be in place to protect us, like security. So that was something that is ongoing process and we will talk about that for the rest of this talk. And this is the enablers that, and what I want to emphasize here is uh, security, interoperability, change of business organization and culture. And this public policy means that governments has to also adjust the rules that we are living upon. Let's just slightly reflect on, uh, on a cultural change and business organization. Uh, Internet of Things will uh, gather data from everything and will analyze that data. But there is no need for us to have, let's say, temperature of every room in a hotel if we don't do something about it. And currently, there is around uh, 60% of the companies that are actually gather some data from their clients, but only 20% of them are analyzing it. The percent of companies that even 
use that data to make a business decision is less than 5% of these 20% of these 60%. So it's, it's still not there that uh, top level management or whomever are building their decision based on data they are gathering. But that, that, that time will come and it will be more decisions based on the data that we get from some sensors than will be decision made by hum humans. And if you think I'm wrong, just think about self-driving cars, how many decisions they are making. So current state of the internet thinks that we have uh, these three groups of uh, solutions or things. So we have connected products like smart watches or smart TVs. Um, we have also some operation that are connected like uh, people are gathering information about uh, the movement of the vehicles where they are and they try to optimize the sales path. And we also have some disturbance in uh, new business models that will never be seen and even never been think of that can be successful. And my favorite uh, kind of example for that is Uber. If you, I hope that most of you have been or have seen the United States and how they cherish their vehicles. It's not just a vehicle, it's not for transportation, it's a way of living, it's a status symbol. Nobody can predict that they will willingly share their precious vehicle and that can be a successful business. And Uber currently have more revenue than all taxi groups as well as limo groups in New York. So Uber generates more money than all of them combined. For us as the developers, these are the key opportunities that we will explore during this uh, building of Internet of Things future. And important ones are how we build and test stuff. If you think about uh, self-driving cars, it is expected to have an accident that will happen between a self-driving car and myself and how the legal will treat that, who has made the mistake. Is the self-driving car has a proper software that actually performing in the context before and at the moment of the accident, how we test that? What confidence we have in that testing? They never test me, luckily for me. We have very built things, very deployed things, how we feed and how we read information, also about what is the information, how we pass messages back and forth. That's all the, the opportunities that we have. And one that we will talk also is about data that we gather in the process. And um, we will analyze all the data that we get. That's one of the things that will happen. The current survey shows that there are a lot of, a lot of things about the IoT development currently, and uh, this is not seen properly, I think. But around 55% of the mobile developers express that they are doing some projects that involve something that is related to Internet of Things. Mostly about health, smart houses, smart city, where the, currently the most investments are. Uh, but if you have even a, a project that collects the geolocation of data or inner location of data, which is kind of location-based services, you are also doing something that is in a domain of Internet of Things. You collect data from the sensors, so pass that data and analyze it. Uh, the fragmentation is, is huge currently, especially it comes from this M2M, which is machine-to-machine -machine communications, and they are totally working verticals, so segmentation is huge, and one of the transition will be to be more 
horizontally spread. So it will not be just for health solution or just for education or just for automotive. The solution will also evolve. Not how, how fast you are accelerate your car, but we will get your profile from your Facebook as well and see should we do something with that. So solution will somehow try to, to be incorporated in more spread around sources and the solution needs to have this horizontal spread, so it not be just automotive. But that was a talk about what is Internet of Things. What I want to talk to about, about today is the protocols and standards and compliance. And the layout currently looks like this. On the upper right corner, uh, you have this uh, notion of web of things, which likes to have sensors and everything connected to the already defined web protocols. And on the opposite diagonal, we have uh, Internet of Things, which is more come from the notion of this machine-to-machine -machine communication. And all that you see on this slide that I managed to, to get from the internet is various protocols that are defining this space. These are only the standardization bodies that are defining the space of connectivity or regardless of the connectivity in, in the current environment. So, Etsy, 3GPP, IEEE, all that you see, V3C, one of that I participate also, OMA, Open Mobile Alliance, defining standards that are applied on mobile industry. You cannot have a device connected to a carrier that doesn't comply to the standards defined by this body. And it's only about connectivity. So one of the things that you should think about when you define what your solution will use, should it be on wireless, on some mobile, on 3G, 4G network, Bluetooth, you should look upon a complementary standard see if there is some compliance involved with your device before you choose your architecture. Because if you somehow get lucky and manage to produce a device and want to connect to something, they will ask you to prove the compliance. That means that you pass a very expensive and long-term testing that you are satisfied with the compliance that these guys are put in place. And I said this is only for connectivity. What we usually forgot the, is the security that is also involved, as well as uh, ever emerging privacy. And in this cloud is only a couple of well-known bodies that define requirements for security and privacy. So your solution will most probably evolve one of them or many of them, especially if you go to health or if you go to money transfer. Even PCI, which is uh, one of the well-known if you want to have some money transfer application. So if you have an application that sell, for instance, uh, touristic uh, vacancies, like hotels or, or apartments in Greece, and you want to have uh, ability to do a payment through your application, most probably you should also satisfy the PCI requirements because there will be uh, a need for it for your application to be compliant in order to world, work worldwide. They will not let you 
to work with Visa credit cards if you're not compliant to that. The interoperability is the key word and whatever you are doing, you should think about how your solution will interoperability, have interoperability horizontally and vertically. So with whom you will interact if you're building, let's say, uh, a sensor or device for as a glucose monitor that I use as an example, where it will be used. If you build a, a something that collects temperature, is it only enough to collect temperature in an environment like this? Or it will be also used in automotive, in some kind of medical facility? Are you satisfied to only be able to work in a houses? Or maybe you should do some more and be able to use the same temperature sensing equipment also in medical environment or in automotive? Why not in avio transport? And we are moving in, in, in that direction that it's not enough to work only in one niche. So you have to, to extend your thinking about when, where are we going tomorrow? If you, if you start says this niche, what is the next extension plan? And how we incorporate that in our solution? So you, you have to think about both in both directions. And as I said, the solution will go horizontally more and more. If you only take like regulations, they are also moving in all directions. So you have the ones that are more business driven and the ones that are more like hardware, software, IT driven. And you have a bunch of them. And as I said, the, the ones they are, I find the most interesting uh, and the ones that we will experience soon enough is the questions about privacy, especially when governments try to protect their citizens and try to establish laws that are regarding the privacy. And we are willingly give some data about us, but the data will flow and the flow will be hardly noticeable from one place to another and uh, what we have currently as a boundaries will be not the same boundaries for the data as well. So you should think about where my solution is currently, what are our current plans, are we compliant or should be compliant, are we compliant today, are we planned to be compliant today, what are our extension plans, and what we are doing tomorrow. All this stuff is uh, currently and some projections, but you will be the ones that will make this world. I will help you in that, but the, the shared biology will be that, that you will be the, the developers of these solutions. And you should start to understand that there are a lot of complexity and a lot of questions to be answered. And you should be involved in the answering that questions. So I just want you to think about your projects. And as I said, why should you care? And I, I, I just want to give you a small uh, example about how the selection of protocols can influence your architecture and your overall solutions. So in the Internet of Things, there are a couple of protocols that are emerging that should be the future ones that will somehow condense this in a, in a, so that we don't have more than 20 protocols just for connectivity, that we will have maybe two or three of them. The, the current 
selection is usually either MQTT and the second one that is also mentioned in the same rate is lightweight M2M. There are slight differences between these two protocols and MQTT is a pretty old one uh, sponsored by, if I'm not mistaken, by IBM at the beginning. Uh, well defined, implemented in and every single programming language. Server is proven so many times that it's working at scale. Easy to use. It's a PubSub. We all know what PubSub is. And it has a, a message that contains a token and a payload. And the token can be whatever you desire and the payload can also be whatever you desire. It has some other features like quality of message, but that's not that important. And it has uh, integrated security, so you subscribe and at a, at a point of your subscription, your authorization is checked. Very, very nice, easy to implement. Um, I have done one project last year with my colleagues. He's an a artist. He produced uh, one uh, exhibition and we equipped his exhibition with some small devices and it was one, uh, I don't know how to explain it, it's a one piece of sculpture that has a stone on top of it and it's represented the slavery. And the stone was connected to a motor and every now and then the stone gets a, a bit upper in the air until it reached the top and then it fall down on this sculpture and produce uh, a noise, like boom. And the funny part was that the motor was connected to a Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi was connected to the internet and the data that we are using for moving this stone was the currency rate between a euro and a dollar. We have also another one, it was aquarium and it has uh, five nozzles and we pumped the air in, in the aquarium and there was a sculpture inside the aquarium. Uh, I'm just an engineering guy, I'm not the artist, so I cannot explain the symbolic of that. But the uh, funny part that we put some microphones around the uh, gallery and the dynamic of the air was uh, influenced by the people talking in the gallery. So. They start walking in the gallery, see one sculpture, see the second one. They start to chat and say, what the hell is this? And then they notice that a bubble start to somehow go slightly different. And they make the connection and they raise their voice and the bubble also change their dynamics and they realize that they can influence the bubbles. And it was funny to see that people are playing with the sculptures. So, as I said, uh, you we used the MQTT in that project. It was very easy for us to, to build. But the problem with the MQTT is this kind of free form of tokens and free form of payload. It is very hard to to ask other companies to use your tokens or use your message format for the payload, so in able to, oh, that's, sorry. <laughs> Let's just fire up the presentation, but it's not needed anymore. I use all my slides. So it's very hard for, for, for you to somehow inter, uh, make an interoperability with others if they, you require that they use your format or your tokens for the messages. They are not so willing to do so. So on the other side of, of, of this, you have the lightweight M2M. Lightweight M2M is built based on uh, device management and it utilizes all the knowledge that we have about device management and it has a well-defined structure of management objects or all the message format that goes between client and the server. Uh, 
even a bunch of them are mandatory. So let's say you, you have to have device information. You cannot go and produce something connected without device information. Any device information you have, manufacturer, you have some ID which is unique planetarily. So there is, that cannot be one. It's like Highlander. They can only be one of this. But the problem with, with this is that you can have nice interoperability because you know the message. You know the information that you can ask that device and you know the format that that device will tell you about it. But the problem is that uh, it's built for the constrained devices, so they use a slightly, um, how to say, constrained technology stack. So the transportation layer for lightweight end-to-end is UDP over the DT TLS. So it's uh, UDP packages, so it's not TCP, it's just uh, packages that are not mandatory to be received, so you, you can lose some of them. And it, it, it has the security of, of uh, certificates and TTLS, but in some cases it's not uh, so problematic. Let's say that you have a, a, a sensor of temperature, and if you lose some readings, like if send you every minute it has a, a, a timer that sends a message with the current temperature, it's okay if you, you're not so accurate in a minute time frame. The temperature in this room will not change so much in a minute. But if it sends alarm about, uh, I don't know, smoke or, or something even more drastic, it would not be good to, to, to miss that information. And based on design or, or choosing one or the other protocols, your overall architecture will change. Should you support only UDP or you should support HTTP? Should, if this is UDP, can I sustain a message loss? How often I expect to have a message lost? If I'm building a server on the other side for interoperability, should I build them both? Why not? Then I can talk with many devices, many sources of information. My server will even be more popular. What is time to market with that decision? How, how the technology is tech, what tricks you have to learn, what libraries you have to use if you choose to have all of them. It's, it, it will impact your solution, even in more ways that you, I can imagine now. Then there is a question about should they communicate directly? If I have a sensors of all temperature in, in my hotel, should they go directly to my server, which is kind of somewhere in the cloud? Is there really needed such information, or should they have some aggregation, some gateway in my hotel that will do some smaller part of management of all that sensors and information, and rarely connect to my server? and pass that information. How many connections should my hotel have in one or the other cases? If I have, like, let's say, a small hotel with 50 rooms, should I engage with 50 connections to my server so everybody just shout their temperature? Or should I have one with a gateway that say, this is the current state of your hotel? And that will impact your solution. And yes, there is no right answer. You have to find it yourself. You have to see what use cases you want to somehow make out of your solution, what need you are satisfying, how your solution fits in a niche that you are working with, what is your future plans, like what is the 2.0 version perspective and build 
your architecture, your knowledge to work in that direction. And that's why you should care. And that's why you should be educated about the standards, protocols that are influencing your decisions. And yes, there is a tendency that we expect that there are some product management that knows all these things and they will put some JIRAs in for us. And our job is just to take one JIRA out, do some coding, shovel that JIRA back and ask the QE guys to verify it. And that will not happen anymore. I hope so. I'm preaching that. So generally, you are the technical people. You know this stuff. You know the consequences of decisions about one or the other architecture. Unfortunately, people that currently are in position to define solutions are more orient or business oriented than technical. And we struggle with them every day. Um, so essentially, I want you to just ask yourself. I cannot give you the right answer. I can give you some like advice and, and maybe what I have seen and how we build some of these standards and why are they looking like this and how we think that will change in the future. For instance, this lightweight M2M -M was starting with this um, almost binary format, but now it can consume and produce JSON format, which is kind of moving in a, in a, in a, in a place where the industry is. It used this constraint RESTful services, which is something that is there from the day one because we realized that this is what people know and it's proven that it's easy to, to grasp. But as I said, you are the ones that should speak your voice and influence decisions. So that was my talk for today. Thank you very much.